All right, what's going on, everybody? Maybe give me a little thumbs up in the channel. If you can hear me. All right, so everybody tuning in on Instagram tonight, you're going to be better off clicking over to YouTube because um, this is going to be a live webinar and I'm going to be doing a shitload of screen sharing. And uh, um, yeah, everything's going to be live on YouTube. Now, if you just want to you know, listen in on Instagram, that's fine. And I'll do what I can to pay attention to the questions on Instagram. Um, but I'll also be taking questions over on the YouTube channel. Um, I will not, yeah, I can't really answer DMs or emails while I'm on a live. So if you have a question, ask it on YouTube in the chat window or Instagram, and I'll do my best to keep track of both. Let's just give this like another one to two minutes for anybody who um, is just tuning in and isn't sure exactly what's going to go on. What I'm going to do tonight is something I'm calling a virtual route planning webinar, because I noticed there's like a bit of a hole. Lots of people do e-scouting, but I find a lot of the guys who do the e-scouting courses and information are located in the States. Most areas in the States are heavily trailed, which means you're more concerned about finding suitable hunting habitat than you are with how to actually get from A to B. Where in BC, the problem is almost in reverse. There's tons of potential habitat, but how you can actually traverse from one location to another could, could be the death of you. Like literally, I've spent eight hours before to go one mile in like real thick, steep and deep BC veg. And so anything that I can do to kind of help um, expedite that process or help people be more efficient, finding a path from one area to another. And I think there's just just some tips and tricks. Like I, I, I don't know all the shit, but I, I, I'm going to do my best to share some tics, tips and tricks that I know. Also, I, you know, people who listen to podcasts are probably sick of hearing me say this, but I was a forestry engineer for 15 years. Now, the most technical part of forestry engineering is road layout. Essentially, when you go to look for timber, you're doing your best to find a big bag of wood. And then really the deal breaker is, can I get a road in there? And is the cost for road development outweighed by how much the, the wood is worth at the end of the road? And if the answer to that question is yes, you build the road. And so finding roads through mountains is actually a really good way to learn the best routes through a mountain because you're trying to find the cheapest way uh, through the mountains and going up and over everything with the road is incredibly expensive. So being able to find more of like a twisty turvy through is normally a much more affordable way to build a road and it also happens to be the most efficient way to walk um this is awesome super glad that people were into this too i just my buddy uh drew a, a sheep tag my buddy bob drew a sheep tag and he actually sent me a question and he and he wanted to know some about this stuff and i started thinking to myself with where we're at in the hunting season it just makes real sense to do a whole webinar Listen, I am slammed right now with work and the show and like everything else going on. So I've done my best to compile some notes. We might be a little bit all over the shop tonight, but that's okay. We're going to get through it. We'll keep it loose and informal. If anybody's got any questions, just shout them out. Um, yeah, let me have a drink and we'll just, we'll hook right into it.
All right. So, and if you see me looking over here, it's because I got a second monitor with a bunch of notes that I didn't want to forget. Okay, so here's basically what we're going to try and do tonight. We're going to get a good grasp of how to plant a decent root in and out through a variety of scenarios. This particular webinar, as I mentioned, is going to be focused on areas with no trails. I think there's lots of other information covering trailed areas, so we're going to purely talk about purebred bushwhacking. Um, like as I said, because most other curriculum is in the States where there's lots of trails. I'm going to talk about the apps and the kind of software applications I use at home. I'm going to talk about the apps that I use in my phone. And I'm going to talk about how I get the info because I do most of my mapping on my desktop computer. And then I transfer any of the routes or waypoints of interest that I make on my computer to my phone. I load up a background cache of mapping data on that phone. And then that's my lifeline. I do take a backup GPS device with me in the woods, but my primary navigation is a phone. Now I would like to take a moment here. When I started working in the woods, we didn't have GPS. We had big ass backpack GPSs that rarely worked. That at some point you would take out to the field to get one point somewhere in your block. And then you would hand map everything to that one GPS location. And all navigation in the field was done with a compass, a clinometer, and a hip chain. And so I don't want people to assume that if you know how to use your phone, that's sufficient. You should understand how to triangulate and locate yourself based on prominent topographical features and find you know how to get home at the end of the night if you had to with just a compass if there's interest in it especially with summer on the way like i i i'd take a bunch of people out for like a, a half a day or something and do a, a like a free land nav course like a lot of this shit is second nature to me because i used a compass for so many years so if that's something that's interests you guys maybe shoot me a dm or leave a comment on something and if i find that there's like enough people Maybe we'll try and all get together and I'll do a little land nav uh, thing. But please don't take, like, because I, I think the phone is a, is a wonderful tool and it's opened up so many areas for us, but don't, don't um, neglect your, like, old school land nav tools and rely solely on your phone because you're, you're going to end up getting your ass kicked one day. Um, I'm going to talk about different layers in Google Earth, how to get back up um, satellite and aerial imagery. I made a note here that Google image is naturally sketchy. Um, and you're going to find Google Earth is the tool I use most frequently on the desktop, but it crashes a lot. And sometimes the satellite imagery is not the best. So um, I'm going to use some other applications and we're going to we're going to bounce back and forth between a bunch of different applications. So I want to say what's up to the YouTube, everybody who's logging in and leaving notes, RB, Wet Coast, Reed, Thomas, thank you all for popping by. Now, uh, let me, let's get some, let's get some shit open here. Let's fire up some windows and see what we got. Okay, we got that. Hang on, where's Fat Maps? Fat Maps is there. Sorry, I'll do what I can to, to never really had to talk while doing some of this stuff before. Close this. Hang on. Okay, now I just got to start sharing my screen. Okay. 
I'm going to ask the guys in YouTube, and there's a bit of a lag here, but maybe the guys in YouTube, can you give me a thumbs up? Everybody should see Google Earth on one side of the screen and Fat Maps on the other side of the screen. All right, okay. Now, I'm gonna minimize this window and I won't be able to see YouTube comments for a bit. Um, you know what I can actually, you know what I'm gonna actually do is if I take this window, no, that's not gonna work. Oh yeah, that'll work. Perfect. Take that window, shrink it down like that. Take my fat maps, because I don't need the whole of fat maps. Move that over there. Put this over here. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. I apologize. Yeah, Devin, this will 100% be recorded and it will be posted live on YouTube, kind of immediately. This is being, you know, sent out on YouTube right now. As soon as this is done, it will be immediately viewable on my channel. Um, it will also go out as an audio podcast. Quick note to everybody listening on audio, you probably would be better off to watch this at home on YouTube because there's going to be a lot of visual elements. Now, quick note about what we're looking at. You will notice that I've dropped a pin and called this Webinar Lake. I want to assure you I have never gone hunting at the location I'm about to share. I have no plans on going hunting at the location I shared. I don't even really know where this is. I picked a part of the province that was not near anywhere I've ever been, and I hope I'm not blowing up anybody's spot. Um, but please, this is not, I'm not just like saying this and then, um, you know, you know, trying to trick you and, oh, this is actually where I'm going sheep hunting this year or something. Don't waste your time. Trust me. This, I, I have no clue if there's anything worth um, looking at at this lake. What I did want was a variety of terrain close by. So you will notice like we've got really steep stuff. We've got some bowls. We've got some basins. We've got some saddles. Um, and so the idea was just to have access to some areas that would show us, you know, the best way to, that, that I could actually use. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do with Google earth is a bit of a, it's a bit of a hack that I think everyone should do with their, with their Google earth. I'm going to first, okay. The first hack is this background imagery. The background imagery that we're currently looking at is actually an ArcGIS layer. This is not what comes with Google Earth. Okay. Now, hang on. There should be. I think there was another saddle point that I took earlier, but it's fine. We can. I can look for it later. Um, this is. I'm going to show you what. So, if I shut this layer off over here on the left-hand side. It's going to take a minute to do it because Google Earth is kind of a flaming piece of shit of a program, but give it a second, it'll shut off. And it's highly possible and actually quite probable that Google Earth will crash once, if not multiple times during this presentation. And we're just going to sit it out and wait. I highly recommend you save your data regularly on Google Earth for that express purpose. So it's just shutting off this layer in the background right now. Okay, so when you think of satellite imagery and Google Earth, it's kind of like a skin. And you can download different skins. 
and different skins come from different recordings at different times. It could be aerial imagery, that is photographs taken from planes or other aerial device. So see how the uh, thing just, just switched? This is what actually shows up on Google Earth. And you will notice, like we're going to go to this saddle later on. Look at this. Look at that shit. So this is what I mean by information stitched together. See how there's clearly a square here where it's just garbage. And then you can see this imagery on the right hand side was taken in the winter time. And this imagery on the other side of this line was taken obviously in the summertime. And so all of this is just stitched together. Now I will post the link to this arc GIS later, uh, GIS layer, and you can email me for it. But essentially, if you just Google world imagery, arc GIS, you will, you will find this. And then essentially you get taken to the arc GIS. And then you just pick this world imagery under map server. And then up here, it says arc GIS earth. And if you click that, it lets you download a KML file. It's either a KML file or a KMZ file. It doesn't matter. When you upload that KMZ file or KML file to Google Earth, it acts as a skin. Um, oh, Alexander, yes, you are supposed to see my screen. If you're not, go into YouTube. If you need the link, it's in my stories. Um, and hop onto YouTube. And don't worry about it. This is all being recorded and will be posted to YouTube later on. So now when I go and turn on, and again, this is going to take a minute, but I want you to take a look at, at Google Earth and then watch what happens when this other background layer comes on. Give it a second. Yeah, small note for Instagram Live. I might try and figure out a way that I could do like a split screen for these things in the future so that I could show my desktop on the top half and just me talking on the bottom half. And to be honest, you don't even need to watch me talking if you can hear me talking. Um, so I'll play with that for, for future things. Mostly, I'm just leaving the IG Live open so that it reminds people that I said I was going to do this and they pop on here, just like what happened with Alexander. And if it's interesting to them, they can go over into YouTube. Once I, and don't worry, once I turn this imagery back on, I'm not going to turn it on and off and on and off. Now look at that. How crazy is that? So that's how much of a difference you get with this different imagery. That like, here's the section that was all like it was just hot trash. It was useless. Um, and so there's, okay, hack number one with Google Earth. Bring in a secondary imagery layer. I recommend world imagery from ArcGIS. Download it as a KML, load it up, Bob's your uncle. You will notice that it slows down your Google Earth a little bit, um, but, the, but the increase in quality is well worth it. Okay, hack number two. I want to go find a steep section. People, number one rule with Google Earth is that you are going to grossly, um, oh yeah, that's not, that's not a bad idea. I'll get into that, Tanner. I don't even know if I'm going to get into it tonight. Let me think about that, how to work that in. Um, but yes, I think we should actually do a whole land nav course, to be honest with you, because, um, I think people's inability to use a compass is kind of shocking. Um, okay, I'm trying to get to a bit of a steep section here. The number one thing people screw up in um, Google Earth is that they underestimate how steep things really are. And they look at Google Earth and they think to themselves, you know, this, this looks reasonable. I should be able to walk up this. Um, 
So let's take a look at this hill over here on the right hand side. This doesn't look too terrible. Now, what I want you to do to your Google Earth at home is you're going to go up to Tools, Options, and in this 3D tab, you're going to notice that there's this terrain box down here called Elevation Exaggeration. And I want you to, right now it's going to be set to 1. I want you to set it to 1.5. Now, what this is actually going to do is give you a more visually realistic representation of how steep the terrain is once you actually get out there on your feet. Now, the reason that this is important is that you are going to make better pre-planning decisions about areas that you can likely get to. People get too optimistic on Google Earth. And they look at shit and they're like, oh yeah, I can walk up that hill and over that basin and through that gully and across that canyon. And then they get out there and they're like, what is this, you know, Mordor of a nonsense? Like this is not what it looked like at home. And the reason for that is that Google Earth has a tendency to grossly visually underrepresent how steep things are in reality. So Go in here, follow the directions I just said, tools, options, 3D view. Um, quick question came in. Do you know if you can change that on the web-based earth? I do not know for sure. It's a good question. Um, going to go back. Unfortunately, it kind of kicked us out of the little thing that we were in, but I can remember... Um, where we were it also looks like for some reason it shut off our imagery but it doesn't really matter for now because we're going to be over here but just trust me see how everything just got way more gnarly looking like this was that i think it was this one no it was this one here we were zoomed in over here and we were looking up this. Hang on, I'm just gonna turn back on this, the world imagery, because it got shut off for some reason. Um, okay, all we really need to know about that is by setting that to 1.5, you are gonna make more realistic, there. Oh, this is interesting, I wonder. It should work. I'm just wondering if because that world imagery isn't built for having that terrain set to 1.5, the reason it actually shut off my, oh no, it's gonna work, great. Okay, sweet. So you will notice now that this stuff on the right, you would clearly never even remotely consider walking up this. like. It's just, it's just gnarly. And if you give it a second, the, um, it will, it will come in quicker and more detail here. Um, this is the only problem with adding and probably because I'm streaming at the same time and have fat maps open and a whole bunch of zoom and a whole bunch of other shit. It's not, it's not helping our cause here. Um, but anyways, I don't want to dwell on this shit too long. Um, I'm just going to clean up some of my notes here so I know I'm not leaving anything unshared. Okay, there. That came in and better. That cleared up now. Yeah. Okay, so let's back up. Now that we have our Google Earth set up the way we want, we've got the imagery we want. We've got the, um, terrain at 1.5, the way we want. Let's assume that we're getting dropped off at this, at this lake over here. Give it a second for this imagery to load. And then I'm just going to, we're just going to do a simple, like plan a little 
get to a glassing point type of type of a walk if we were going on for example let's say a sheep hunt okay so one of the things if i was if i was going in here right away the, one of the first things i'm thinking is like how do i get the biggest bang for my buck like i just got dropped off here i'm trying to see as much terrain as quick as i can i mean i'm going to have a little look around this knob over here like immediately jumps out to me because although it looks like there's a big flat here and you're going to be able to see once you're in this shit down here on the side of the lake you're you're not going to be able to see you know much of anything um and you're going to need to get up out of this valley bottom in order to see anything now the reason i like to look for ridges in the middle is that they're going to give me a panoramic view like if i climb up on this side the only thing i'm going to be able to see is straight across and if i go all the way to that side i'm only going to be able to see straight across if i climb this ridge in the middle then i'm going to have like a 360 panorama i'm going to be able to see into this basin i'm going to be able to see out here so the first thing i do let's assume that the plane drops us off on this little lake i measured it early it's a kilometer half long it's not a giant lake but it's big enough you know that we can land a, pl a, a smaller plane on so it drops us off and and i'm going to do my scouting here at home like what do i want to do now the first thing i'm going to note is all of this wet spoogy nonsense and i'm going to give you a little trip a trick flatter is not always better in fact you can kind of assume it's not better for the most part and shorter is not always better as a general rule the faster that you can walk the better off you are so you're going to be trying to find areas with kind of like the least number of obstacles and in british columbia obstacles are things like water obstacles are things like vegetation primarily vegetation is the worst most of the areas i hunt you're just you're you're trying to get out of the trees i've done a lot of island hunting on vancouver island and haida Gwaii. you're trying to get out of the salal done a lot of coastal stuff and so kind of the steeper that you can get and like finding little benches you're, you're normally better off so let's assume i get dropped off here you know somewhere on the corner of 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 this lake or whatever the first thing i'm going to say to myself is i'm not going anywhere near any of this shit because it's going to be soaking wet i'm going to be falling all over my ass there's it's going to take forever to walk through here i've already outlined that this ridge is going to provide me like a really nice glassing opportunity so i would do something like try and get back away from this edge as quickly as possible and try and ride now i wouldn't immediately start walking up here because you can see the kind of convex nature of this walking along this side slope is going to be really hard on your ankles but you can see there's like this nice path right here that it's you call this the knee of the slope because it's right where the angle it's kind of like the curve of the blade of the hockey stick and it, and it starts to get flattened out so you're high enough that you're out of this wet spoogey shit but you're not so high that you're you're gonna get you know shin splints and and whatnot from walking on a side slope for a couple kilometers so these are the types of things i'm looking for right away right at the edge of this tree line and i'll just bushwhack whatever i need to this kind of looks shitty this looks like there's a creek in here because of the break in the trees and this looks like there's a creek in here because of the break in the trees creeks are a good thing because they are going to gather water and if get if water is gathered into a creek then it's not going to be dispersed across the whole landscape and we can cross a creek in a couple of steps so i would rather encounter something like that the other thing that i do is i always plan my roots and i draw the route and then i import that route into my phone because just having waypoints on your phone you're constantly having to zoom out and zoom in to like replot your your path to the waypoint whereas if you actually draw the line work 
on your Google Earth and then import that into your phone. You just got to pop your phone out, look at it for two seconds, and then recognize, oh, I'm a little bit off. Um, and then you don't have to like replot every single time. So it's a much more efficient way. Normally, I would like, you know, pre scout this a couple times and like zoom in and zoom out, but just for the sake of efficiency, I'm going to grab my little line tool. I'm going to assume I get dropped off by the plane here. I'm going to stick, and I, I'm literally drawing what I think is the path that I would walk to get over to this glassing knob. Okay. Now that's as far as I'm going to draw it right now because I'm going to want to zoom out and zoom in. So I'm just going to save this as path zero one. Now a trick is save all of your paths, waypoints, and points of interest for one hunt in one folder. And that way you can export that one folder as a KML file. You can import that folder into your GPS application of choice. I use Onyx, and then it shows up on my desktop and on my phone at the same time. And if you keep it all organized in a folder, then you don't got to hunt down and export like 400 files, you know, a week before your hunt. Okay, so now we get dropped off at the lake. We're trying to get to our first um, glassing knob. Now this is where stuff gets interesting. So we've kind of outlined that it's tough because it's like green on green, but like we'd like to get up to here somewhere to have a sit and a glass. Now there's a couple of questions. One, are you better off coming from back here Let's assume we let's assume there's a little flat spot right here just for the sake of argument. I'm going to show you a minute in fat maps how you can verify if there's a flat spot up there. But let's just assume that um, there is a little flat spot up here. Now, are you better off starting back here and kind of slowly working your way up here or are you better off kind of staying down low and then walking up the ridge? This is something that you're really only going to learn with experience. But in my experience, I would stick to the top of the tree lines. I would come in low and then I would probably walk. I've got this line drawn a little bit high. You know, I could edit it. If you right click on, oh, hang on a second. If you hover over, oh, well, let me do it. Normally, if you right click, it will let you um, undo the last point of uh, the file. But for some reason, this one's not letting me. Okay, there we go. So let's assume we're going to bring this down here, actually. We're going to come through here. I'm going to come through here and then what I would do, you can walk steeper terrain in the trees for a variety of reasons, but one, it's safer. When you start getting out onto this open grassy shit and trying to walk straight up, you're asking for a nightmare to happen because then if you do start sliding back down the hill, you're fucking ass over tea kettle and you're gone. You're never going to catch yourself until you like run into a flat or some of these trees, but something like this. I, I would go, I would walk up this for sure. So let's say then we plot our route up to here. And let's say that's where we find we've got a little flat spot. For some reason, it won't let me draw a dot. Okay, so we'll, we'll assume that the line goes further. I would screw with it. But here's the next thing that's really interesting. You can go right into your measurements if we put this on kilometers. So that's 3.3 kilometers. So all of a sudden we know like that's not a bad little walk after you got dropped off. And if you were just going up for a quick glass, you could even drop most of your shit back here, you know, bomb up here, have a glass before kind of making, you know, major decisions for the rest of the day. Another tip that I want to give you 
is utilizing Street View. So when you're in Google Earth and you've got this, um, you've got this little dude here. Now you can take this little dude and you can drop him. Oh, hang on a sec. This is one of the annoying things that Google Earth does. Okay, we're gonna zoom back in here. And you can see like, it's not out of the realm of the possible to think like, there might be a little bench here that you could just sit on for a couple hours in glass. I would not mess with any of this shit over here. That's way too sketchy. But anyways, grab your little dude. Hang on. And if you drop your little dude at your little flat spot, it will take you down and give you the view of what you would see if you were standing right here. And then what you can do is zoom out. So if we were on the side of this hill, you can see now, we can see all the way over into this basin. We can see back into this basin over here. I'm gonna keep going around in my panorama. And that's why I like these little island ridges. We're getting back into this basin. And I mean, if we're on a sheep, like we're gonna be able to see, is there any sign up here? You're trying to let your eyes do the walking for you before you get committed to, you know, actually getting your boots. And now more importantly, we can go all the way over here. Google Earth is being a bit of a bitch. Give me a second. And like, if you've got decent optics, like you're going to get a good line. Like you're going to be able to see a lot of detail. Like this stuff is not that far away. Now there's one more thing. You, so we'll be basically assume for this sake of argument, you can go around in, in a 360 and you can move this around up and down the hill, all kinds of stuff. So the main points there are when you're starting to go steep up a hill, instead of going side hill and trying to like work the contours all the way up in most instances you're better off to like hug the tree line and then go straight up the ridge because the ridge is going to have the best walking and probably the safest route now also if you're curious how much elevation you're going to gain between your your poc which is your point of commencement commencement and your pot your point of termination basically the beginning and the end of your path if you just right click on your line and then go to show elevation profile, give this a bit of a second and it's going to load this up. So that's not bad. So we're going to go from roughly 987 meters to 1220 meters. So, you know, what are we gaining? 200 and 250 meters in elevation total and you can you can drag this on here it'll actually show you the grade of the slope at any particular portion and it will show you um what the particular elevation is and so like and that's in percentage not degrees i'm not going to get into the math um but like 45% is around 30 degrees. So the fact that this is all under 45%, like this is 100% walkable, walkable terrain. Um, 45 degrees is getting close to, to 90%. Um, okay, so there's, there's little mini lesson number one. How do we get up to a glassing spot? We want to stay away from the water. We want to ride the tree line. Want to go directly up the ridge lines, couple tips and tactics of, of tools that you can use in Google Earth to make your, your life a little bit easier. Um, now, let's, let's look at this a different, a different way. 
So now we're going to go over here into fat map on the right hand side of my screen. So now we're going to see here's the little lake. This is the path that we took. And here you can see fat maps is a bit of a pain in the ass because you can't click and drag with the mouse. The iPad application for fat maps is almost a little bit better. But what fat maps does better than Google Earth is highlight potential flat areas. And if you remember, I said like right around here, there looked like there might be a spot worth sitting. Now, if we go over on fat maps, not does that only look way more likely, we have a cool little tool that we can use to validate that. So if you click this, this little layered icon um, down at the bottom right, and you go into overlays, and you click your flats, and then you come back, we should just be able to close that now. Oh, and that should show like that, beautiful. Okay, so the nice thing is that kind of, I mean, that's the thing about having a theory. You want to get invalidated at home on the computer as opposed to out there in the field. So it doesn't show anything perfectly flat, but I do feel pretty comfortable. Like you could sit, you, you could find somewhere in this, like this would be a great spot to sit for the for a couple hours and, and glass. And it's not that bad of a walk at all from there. And you can see that Fat Maps does a far superior job of kind of highlighting that area than Google Earth does. What Fat Maps doesn't do nearly as well as Google Earth is allow you to like, you can draw lines, you can drop points, but the importing and the exporting and all that kind of stuff is not nearly as nice as Google Earth, which is why I keep everything, everything lives in Google Earth, and I look at the other applications to supplement Google Earth. Now, I want to touch on something else. What I actually use this flats for is finding camping spots. So one of the nice things about Fat Maps is that when you preload the data on your phone, it loads all the layers. So when you're out in the field, you can literally turn this flats layer on. So let's say we were heading up into this basin and you're like, ah, am I really going to be, am I going to have to walk all the way up into this basin and then all the way back down in one day? Or am I going to be able to camp up here? You could literally come up and you can see right away like a hundred percent in all of these green spots, you're going to be able to find something decent to camp at. And then the question is just like, you know, is there some suitable water close by? Excuse me. Um, so that's really the benefit of, of this flats aspect. So I have the background map loaded up in fat maps and onyx. I use Onyx in order to traverse throughout the day, but Onyx doesn't have a 3D field view and Fat Maps does have a 3D field view. So you can like take your fingers and you can morph it around just like this, like you can at home. You can't do that with Onyx on your phone in Canada. I think there, I think there are areas in the States where they've updated it, but not with Canada. So I, on my phone, I use both Fat Maps and Onyx. Also, this gives me a backup in case one of the applications dies um, or I lose the background imagery, I've got a backup. Now, some people are going to ask why Onyx? It's the mo more expensive of the iPhone based mapping applications. I've been using Onyx for five years, probably well over 100 days per year. And in fact, I, I even used to use it when I worked in the field as, a, as an engineer. Not one single time have I ever lost imagery or waypoints while I was out of cell service. I can't say that for any other application, whether it's Google Earth, Fat Maps, some of the cheaper phone apps, every single other app at some point in the history of me using it, I've gone to open it and it just shits the bed. And when you're on a 13 day sheep hunt and it's day three and you open your phone and the background imagery is just gone, it's gone for the rest of the trip because you're not going to be back in cell service and be able to load that up. So the reason that I trust 
Onyx is that it's reliable and it might cost a couple extra bucks. And maybe there's other reliable ones out there, but at this point in my life, I'm not interested in doing the legwork to, to find them again. So Onyx and Fat Maps go on the phone. Background imagery gets loaded up for both. All of my points and waypoints drawn in Google Earth get loaded up into Onyx. And I really only use Fat Maps for the 3D viewing capability. Okay, hang on. I got to go back to my notes. Getting all over the place here. Okay, we covered using a uh, line feature to do the elevation profile. Now, there's another element of roots that I wanted to cover, and that's creeks, because we're going to come back into Google Earth now. Most, actually, you know what? Maybe we'll stay in Fab Maps. Fab Maps seems to be working a little quicker for our purposes. Now, most people, sorry, give me a second. I got to get my, my bearings. For some reason, most people, I'm going to shut off this uh, flat slayer because it's distracting me now. For some reason, most people think it would be efficient to walk down a creek. I think it's because by, by human nature, we feel more comfortable when we're traversing a feature that can be followed and we don't have to consistently take bearings over and over again. But I can assure you, as a guy who traversed creeks for five years of my job, like mapped creeks, creeks as a general rule, um, you know what? Sorry, Wet, Wet Coast just jumped in and said he's had great success with iHunter. Um, and in fact, um, and it does show Canadian land use and, and private and public. I did just start to play with iHunter a year or two ago, and I can't uh, report having any problems with iHunter as well. So if you're newer or just you want a more BC-based app, I know they have BC and they have Alberta Maps. I think that's probably another really great option. I haven't had the opportunity to play with like importing and exporting and all that kind of stuff, but um, it's also a Canadian company, so um, it's probably a good idea to try and support them where you can. So there's another shout out for another, for another app. And, and please, by no means is, am, do I, you know, am I the be all end all of, of mapping applications or, or phone applications in general? If anybody has any other recommendations, um, please let me know. And again, it's, be, it's a lot to do with the fact that I hunt in the States a lot or did pre COVID. And so having everything housed in Onyx means I don't have to worry about separate applications. Um, but we are BC boys for the most part. So, um, I, I probably should be using more BC friendly apps. Now back to the Creek thing. Most people assume that it's easy to follow a Creek or it's a good idea to follow a Creek. And I'm telling you, I'm going to, he, here's the thing with a caveat. The answer is, yeah, it can be. I like it if I can have a Creek in earshot or eye shot. Because then I don't know if it's just, oh, if there's a creek 200 meters down to my right, I'm in the right thing. Then I can just put my head down and pound some miles out. And I don't have to do too much thinking. And you will find trying to reverse through the raw bush, the thing that breaks you down the most is how much thinking you have to do and how much decision making you do. And that's where I see people burn out out in the field more often than not. It's cold, it's wet, it's steep, and then they're forced to make these really complicated decisions again and again and again, and then they just kind of like, shit just falls apart and they start making bad decisions. And so anything that we can do to reduce the amount of decisions we need to make in the field will increase the amount of endurance that we have in the field, which will increase the likelihood of us killing an animal, which is the ultimate priority while we're out there. This is the other reason that I'd like to draw all my roots and import them into my phone. Because then I just, am I on the line? Yeah, then keep walking, bitch. I don't think, I just walk. 
And if I'm off the line, am I above it or below it? You're below it. Okay, walk up the hill. All right, good. Keep going straight. Like, I'm looking for, like, quick action, little thought. Um, okay, so now let's take another scenario. Let's say we got dropped off at this lake, and for whatever reason, we don't, we're, we're not interested in what's over here. Maybe there's other hunters over there. Maybe we've been to this area before, and this stuff's not good. Where we really want to get to is like this shit over here, you know? Like clearly that's a different timber type. This is a, a thicker grain, which, can, which means it's an older, more mature timber type. It's darker in color. Um, so it's gonna be a different, it's likely a different species or a different mix. Um, and, and let's say for whatever reason, that's the area where we wanna, where we wanna get to. And we're looking at a whole bunch of different ways over there. What really jumps out to me right away, and the reason I've put this point over here is a saddle. When you're traversing through the raw bush, saddles are, are one of these features that you want to get to know really well. Because if you're trying to traverse across a range, like we live in British Columbia, this is not the rest of North America. You do not go up and over mountains here for the most part. If there's a mountain, you're fucked. You're going around it. Like, look at all of this. Here, I'll zoom in over here because it seems to be loading quicker. Like, you're not walking over any of this shit. Like, it's just going to be gnarly. Now, some of this you might be able to walk across, but for the vast majority, and that, that's the other thing, any of this, like, raw gray, raw brown stuff you see on any of these mapping applications, just don't even think about it. It's just death. You're not gonna be able to walk up there. Now there, there are exceptions to that, but for the most part, all of this stuff is, is off limits. However, when you start seeing, I always get these arrows, like see how this goes, this is called like a saddle here. It's not really well defined, but it's basically like a hump between two basins where the ridges come down and there's like a bit of a flat spot. Now, here's our lake back here. And so again, let's assume we want to get to that other side. What I would think about right away, all this spoogy shit, and I, for the interest of time, I'm not going to draw the lines, but assume I would end up drawing a line through all this stuff. I'm not going to want to go in here because it's going to be spoogy and gross. I don't want to go down here because this is a really big creek. And so it's going to have really just marshy, shitty spots all over the place. I love seeing this line right here because it means this little section is raised up. So I'd literally draw a line right through here. I would come over here. I'd get up on this. Now we're going to zoom out. And I would start coming up over here. And this is one of those sections where I would not, don't think about walking down in the creek because it's going to be terrible. And like, listen, man, I could be wrong. Oh, that's another note I want to make right now because I actually, I pointed this out and I wanted to, now shit's moving in Google Earth for no reason. There was a couple notes that I made. Okay, number one, don't be married to your plan. Number two, have several backup plans. So when I make a plan, it is based upon some assumptions that I'm making about what that ground is gonna look like based on my previous experience, hunting similar areas, seeing similar timber types, seeing similar colors, seeing similar you know, shapes and shading, I'm using intuition and pattern recognition to take a best guess at what things are going to look like on the ground. But until I put boots on the ground and ground truth it, I don't know. But what, once you do put boots on the ground, you want to immediately let that kind of update your plan. Like all that shit I said about the creeks, some creeks that goes right out the window, man. Like something like this, that's real grassy and open like this. Like, dude, that might just be a cakewalk. I mean, who knows? Is it most likely? No, it's probably shit. But it could be good. So you're going to want to stick your head in there before you go do whatever. 
But the, the takeaway here is don't be married to your plan. Pick a, pick a route that you like, but realize that once you get more information with boots on the ground, feel free to update that plan and change as you will. Now, here's the, the stuff that I really want to talk to you about this. So we're going to walk all the way through here. It's pretty clear where you would walk. I'm just going to stay up off the creek edge on the dry stuff as much as I can. Now, this, th this, is, worth, this is worth talking about. A little bit so see how this dips off it is a bad idea because one might think well if i'm trying to go over here the quickest route because this is very shallow this is very easy i could come up here no problem and then somebody's like oh, you just deek over no that's not going to happen this is going to be very shitty and probably inoperable and then you're probably going to have to walk all the way back down here and up through here. So this is one of those areas where you're going to like want to hug the contour. I would come, there's clearly some kind of bench in here. I would come through here somewhere and then start hooking around here. And I may even cross. In fact, that's what I would do. I would come down here. I would cross this stream and then I would head this way. And I would keep going up here. And again, I would stay 100, 200 yards off this creek the whole way. I actually picked the right direction that time. That was satisfying. Um, one of the notes I want to make, sometimes creeks are heavily incised. And incised means there's really sharp walls on each side. And so... Don't just assume. Now, something like this, because of the shading of it, you don't really... I was trying to find a better example earlier when I was going over this. But here's the, the one thing that is like a warning bell to me about this creek is the amount of white. And this doesn't look that big, but I mean, this could easily be, you know, three, four meters across, 10 feet across. And if there's this much like white running water in here, this could be a beast of a creek to get across. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind when crossing a creek, especially like a steep creek with heavily running water, is to look for locations where the creek flattens out. Creeks don't tend to run on constant gradients because of the way waterfalls and the way you know, different topography is formed, they tend to like go down and then flatten and then down and then flatten more like a staircase. So looking for, you know, like you can tell this kind of drops here and this drops here, but this little area here looks pretty flat. I would not like to cross a heavily incised creek on a steep pitch like this or a steep pitch like this. I would prefer to cross it on a flat pitch like this for a variety of reasons, but that's just something to keep in mind. But again, if I was going over this saddle, don't try and come up this, this creek. Um, stay 100 to 200 yards up and off of it. The vegetation's not going to be as dense. Uh, the sidewalls are not going to be as steep. The walking in general should just be smoother. Again, the general note here is um, faster is usually better. So the faster you can walk, even if it means going further, is usually is usually better. Okay, let me see what else I got. After that, it's pretty smooth sailing. You can kind of do whatever you want through here, do whatever you want through here. And then you're into like some pretty creamy stuff over here where you, for the most part, you can do whatever you want. Um, Hang on, I'm just going to go back to my notes and see what else I got here. That was something else. I was trying to find a good example. Hang on. If you're trying to get up and over things or through places, sometimes it's a good idea You know what this might be a really good example right here let's look at the topography for this
Okay. So. Yeah, there we go. That's nice. So everybody has seen like a road switch back to get up a hill. A switch back is like those big S curves. Logging roads do it all the time. And the reason that they do it is that roads are constrained about what gradient they can run. A road you can pretty much build anywhere, but it's the vehicles that have to drive on the road that are, you know, restricted to, to driving up certain grades. So for example, if you wanted to get, hang on, let me hide this. Let's say we're trying to get over to here. Now, you cannot go straight up the end. This much we know for sure. Like that gradient is too steep. This stuff, can everybody see how crazy tight these topos are and then how wiggly these topos are? That is not good. That's Bluff City. There's a reason. And see how these ones are in shade? Like if I turn off this layer right now, I guarantee you, oh yeah, like look, it's just terrible. And I didn't need to see the picture in order to tell that. You can tell that, like the, these are when things get craggy. Like they, they, they get squiggly topo lines because you're getting really tight stuff and then really far apart stuff. So for a general rule, when you see really erratic topographical features like this, you don't, you want to steer clear. You're looking for like more moderate terrain. So if that's the case, if we spin back to this other side, like this is no walk in the park. This is not great shit here, but it's not impassable. Okay. Now, one thing to note is that based on topo lines alone, okay, the further topo lines are apart, the more gradiated or the, the shallower the grade is going up. So in a lot of ways, just heading right up the middle here is ideal. Now, the problem with doing that is that most gullies come to a head wall. And once you've walked up the gully to a head wall, for the most part, by the time you reach that head wall, you're hooped. Now you're too far up the canyon to actually like back out and start working your way up the contours. And when you're working your way up contours, you want to think about taking in as few contour lines as possible over distance. And you want to think about like turning or utilizing these like flat, flatter-ish areas where you can like gain more ground or like get up and over stuff. So again, this one is pretty, sorry, I always spin that in the wrong direction. This one is sketchy, I'm not going to lie to you, but if I was out in the field, let me turn the I would not be opposed to giving this one a go. So anytime you see this exposed gray, I'm going to want to stay away from that. Now, what I would probably do is walk up to like maybe here or what I might do. Yeah, that's 100% what I'm going to do. So this kind of illustrates my point perfectly. If, if, if you walked all the way up here, by the time you get here, you're kind of hooped because you're probably not going to get back up any of these features. And again, this isn't a sure bet. You could, once you see this in reality, you might realize I'm, I'm out to lunch and this is why it's important to have backup plans. But what I would probably do is start back here and I would work up, see this kind of flat, shallower set of topos and then right above this shaded spot and then i would just start working my way up and i would think based on this shading here i might loop back this way and try and come up this is like a bench so you can probably walk here but i think somewhere in here there's a route to be had now whether or not you know there's still it's sketchy. 
this is about the edge of the things that I would want to, and I'm pretty aggressive when it comes to root planning, but any worse than this, and I'm going to start to, um, I'm just going to find another way, you know. Okay, so that was the note I wanted to make about topo lines and, um, and uh, head walls of canyons. Okay, look for bare rock on your map, getting bluffed out. We already talked about that. We talked about the little man and street view. We talked about using 3D, zooming in and out frequently. And here's another thing, you know, like, okay, that looked all right in, um, fat maps. Now, where is that in relation to our lake? That's our lake over there. And that was there. So it's all the way through here and then to there. So my point being, I think it's this one right here. So here it is in Google Earth. So sometimes it's nice just to come over to a different application and like give it another look. And sometimes just the different satellite imagery, the different ways. And remember, we've put this to an exaggeration of, of 1.5. And this is looking, I mean, this is definitely border. I wouldn't hinge the success of my trip or my route on this path especially after looking at it in Google Earth. Like there's a slim possibility here, but it's pretty slim. So that's the only note I want to make there is that especially for these borderline routes, look in several different applications because you might just get a different angle on something that is a little nicer. Okay, I talked about the different imagery and loading up the ArcGIS layers. We just talked about swapping between programs. I mentioned earlier when you're trying to gain elevation, getting on a ridge line and following it all the way up from the bottom tends to be the best way to get up to the top of things. As a general rule, you'll notice that animals also primarily take ridge lines. Like most of your um, game trails are going to be on ridge lines. That's for that's for good cause because they tend to be the nicest areas to be. Okay. I talked about not walking creeks. Don't be married to your plan. Have multiple routes. Put routes on your phone. It's more efficient in the field. Use flats to look for camping spots. How to navigate saddles. Cross creeks at flat points or at least follow the contours. And walking fast is better than walking straight. So, so I don't know. That's kind of like the majority of what I wanted to cover tonight. If anybody has any specific questions, I am more than happy to help you answer them. If you have any specific areas. I was going to say, if anybody wanted me to open up an area and talk about roots, I would. But I realized I might inadvertently end up sharing somebody's honey hole. Um, and I don't, I don't want to do that even if it's just, you know, an accident. So we're not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. But if one of you guys like one-on-one, -on -one, you've got an issue where you're planning to go and, and you just want some feedback on a route, shoot me a DM or whatever. I'll hop on Google Earth with you and we'll, we'll FaceTime and like try and figure out, you know, what the best way to get in would be. 
I think the best advice I can give is just like spend time in these applications, zoom in, zoom out, draw roots, and then think about those roots. And I take notes on my phone when I'm out in the field. Like this is what I thought it was going to look like. This is what it actually looked like. So that the next time I'm in this situation where I'm planning a route, um, I have, I have better, you know, intuition is just pattern recognition. Okay. The more times we see a particular occurrence or a particular situation evolve, the more likely we are to predict that situation in the future based on us recognizing one or more patterns from the past. So the more patterns that we can recognize and store in our brain, the better our intuition becomes. And so if you need to like write some notes in order to, you know, improve that for yourself or do whatever, I mean, so you pay more attention to it, then have at her. But that's one of the things I do. Um, but I'm also writing notes about how gear is breaking down and how my nutrition was and what my energy levels were like. Like I'm pretty, pretty, you know, OCD about a bunch of that stuff. But yeah, spend time in these programs. I think the biggest thing too I can, I can pass on is like plan the shit out of it. Draw all your potential routes and put it all on your phone. Just having a bunch of waypoints on a phone is not nearly as efficient as having actual roots on a phone. Um, and play with that. See what you like, see what you don't like. Get back to me after you've tried a couple things and, and if there's something that you liked or, or didn't like. Um, I'm trying to think if there's... Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, no more questions in the YouTube. No more uh, questions on Instagram Live. I appreciate everybody showing up. Um, I hope this was beneficial in some way. If you want a round two on this and you have some more specific questions about things that would be beneficial to cover, just shoot me a DM or whatever and we'll we'll get it covered. And um, oh wait, Thomas, how do you determine the vegetation in an area or how big the trees are? That's a tough one, man. Now, if we were gonna get technical, there are timber types, like the entire province has been timber typed. And what that means is that basically through photo analysis, some of it done via computer, some of it done via human being, they have gone and assessed the age class, the height, the density, and the species composition of all the areas of forested cover in British Columbia. And if we were to draw up a map with timber types on it, you would see little like, uh, you know, three to four digit numbers, like nine, five, six, uh, S, X, H, W, or something like that. And that would be an age class of nine, a density, um, it's been a while, man. And then it would tell you like leading species and following species. And if you've been doing this long enough, that can tell you that kind of what to expect. Here's the caveat to all of that. Most of the time it's out to lunch. <laughs> like unless you're in an area where they're doing a lot of commercial logging, because that's where people spend their time and the energy appropriately timber typing. It, it, it's really just like throwing some shit against the wall and seeing what sticks. Here's the thing. I assume until proven otherwise that it's garbage, that it's going to be shit to walk through. Like most of, most of this stuff is terrible. Okay. So a bit of an ad, a bit of an insight into the question. Thomas says, I'm trying to scout out some spots in Ontario, but we don't have crazy ridges for areas to glass. I found a couple of spots that have a couple hundred meters in elevation change, but it looks dense as fuck. Yeah, you're hooped. Um, for the most part, even for us, like, I don't know if you can still see my screen, but see all these areas up on the high here. If you're in these trees, you're not going to see shit. The only way we can glass stuff, even out here, even if you're getting up like five, 600 meters in elevation, you never see out through these trees. And if you do, it's like a little like window pane of an opening. It's not like something you can actually glass. You have to break free of the cover. 
Now, that being said, what, yeah, that's all on Google Earth. Now, that being said, if you can look for little openings in, on, in Ontario, I'm from Ontario, what you're probably going to be looking for is rocky openings. So if you can get on those little elevation rises that you're talking about and look in Google Earth, go in really close and, and actually look and look in fat maps, look in Google Earth, upload the different layers like I told you and look for little rocky openings. Because if you can get like a 20 by 30 or a 30 by 40, excuse me, rocky opening, then you're, the likelihood of you being able to glass a little bit is going to be much better. Now, the only other thing I'm going to say is if you're standing in the middle of a forest, even if you can glass out, you probably ain't going to be able to see shit because you're just going to be looking into more trees. So most of the stuff that I'm aware of in Ontario, you're like still hunting, setting up cams, tree stand hunting. And the reason you're doing that is simply because you, you, you can't glass for shit anyways. Um, okay. My laptop battery is, is fading out. So I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you, everybody. Deeply appreciate it. If you could take a moment and engage with the platform, throw a like on the YouTube video would help a lot. Um, like comment, share, subscribe to the, to the podcast. If you want some merch, mindfulhunter.com slash shop. Uh, if there's anything I can help out with in the future, Shoot me a DM on Instagram, mindful underscore hunter, or shoot me an email, j at mindfulhunter.com. And as always, thanks for tuning in.